Hello, and thank you for joining us today for our presentation on empowering translators of marginalized languages through language technology. There are currently 235 million people in need of humanitarian assistance who speak over 3,000 different languages. Many, if not most of them, sit behind a wall, their needs invisible to us because of the languages they speak. The wall is there because we don't speak the local languages and there are no tools in these low resource or marginalized languages, so information doesn't flow. They can't access life-saving information and we can't hear their voices. This map shows you the language diversity and complexity to crisis response, specifically for COVID-19. The dark areas indicate the number of languages spoken in each country. Translators Without Borders is working to ensure that people have access to the information they need in the languages they understand. And we are breaking down that wall through our crisis response. Our mission is to help people get vital information and be heard in the languages they speak and understand. Specifically with our Gamayun program, we're applying advanced language technology to humanitarian contexts, focusing on marginalized languages to enable two-way communication. The ultimate goal is to be able to take audio from one language and get it in another language, such as from English to Rohingya, so that people can access up-to-date information about services and critical messages in their own language, but also so that the voices of people affected by crisis can be heard by the organizations trying to serve them, especially in oral languages or languages with no standardized script, so that we can really reach those with low literacy and are hardest to reach. We're developing tools that enable this two-way communication, taking audio and turning that into text through automatic speech recognition, translating that text through machine translation, analyzing the text to inform decision-making and improve programs, and turning the text then back into speech through TTS, text-to-speech. To build these tools, we need data, a lot of data. As you can see here, for French, there are over 200 billion sentences that are openly available. But for Hausa, which is spoken in Nigeria, there are around the same number of native speakers as French, but there are only 400,000 sentences. There's a huge disparity and people who speak marginalized languages are being left behind. Our Gamayun Language Equality Initiative addresses this gap, focusing on marginalized languages where there is little data available. Here is a map showing the languages we are currently working on. It's a dynamic list that changes. It's determined by a combination of several factors. First, we have focused on our country programs where we are present in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Northeast Nigeria and Bangladesh for the Rohingya refugees. Then there are the needs from our partners responding to humanitarian crises. For example, currently with Tigrinya, one of our harder to source languages, it's in high demand because of the recent conflict in the Tigray region of Ethiopia that erupted last month, resulting in over 1 million people being displaced. Organizations in Sudan are struggling to communicate with the newly arrived refugees. Our list is also affected by what's happening in the technology landscape. So, for example, if Microsoft or Google decide to build a machine translation for Canary tomorrow, we wouldn't want to compete with that. Our added value is in the hard to source languages and our community of translators who speak these native languages. We can summarize our working areas in terms of NLP in these three main points which are first, language data collection. If a language doesn't have any data out there, we need to basically start creating it. Secondly, is development of machine translation engines. This is basically for, for languages that we can't find any service out there, and we are basically developing that. And finally, is machine transcription. This is needed as much as machine translation since many of the communication is done in a spoken form through surveys, interviews, and so on. And there's a lot of work invested on the transcription and translation of these materials. Among these, we are investigating automatic speech recognition and speaker diarization However, we're not going to go into detail in this talk. So starting with language data collection. As we said, we collect both parallel and audio data. 
In our initiative called Gamma Yun Kids, we collect audio and text data for the marginalized languages that we just listed. So Gamma Yun Kids come in sizes. These are basically the mini kit of 5,000 sentences, small kit of 10, medium of 15, large of 30,000 sentences collected in several pivot languages that we use in our translations like English, Spanish, and French, and then are translated into the Gamayun languages. So among these right now, we have the mini kits available in several of the languages we work with. For Nigerian languages, Hausa and Kanuri, the pivot language being English, we have parallel to English data available for Rohingya as well. While for coastal Swahili, we use English, for Congolese Swahili and Nande, being languages of Democratic Republic of Congo, we parallel them with French. So Gamma and Kids deal with general domain data. It's for basically a starting point. However, what happens if you're dealing with a highly specialized domain like COVID-19? The TICO-19 project stands for Translation Initiative for COVID-19 is a partnership with several academic institutions in George Mason University, Carnegie Mellon University, and John Hopkins University, and also industry players like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, translated and Apple. The aim of TICO-19 is to build COVID-19 domain data in translation memories both for assisting translators and institutions that do translation in creating COVID-19 related material, and also to build specialized adapted uh, machine translation engines. So until now, the TICO-19 dataset consists of sentences translated into 36 languages. These are basically 3000 sentences in each of them. And all of these data sets are shared publicly and freely through the TICO-19 portal. Next, I'm going to demonstrate our efforts in terms of machine translation building. So in our first phase, we have focused in the languages Levantine Arabic, Tigrinya, and Kongli Swahili. The main techniques we employ in these under-resourced settings can be listed as domain adaptation, dialect adaptation, cross-lingual transfer learning, and synthetic parallel data creation. Our objectives being basically from automated media monitoring to assisting our both professional and non-professional translators that are in our translation community. So for Levantine Arabic, we have partnered with World Food Program, where their aim was to monitor and see complaints and praises of Syrian refugees residing in Jordan that share messages through the message boards uh, moderated by an organization called Cabron. So what we did is we have collected a small data set, an in-domain data set of 5,200 sentences with the aim of building a machine translation engine. So since this data is pretty small to build any kind of um, usable engine, we have built a base model in modern standard Arabic, which has no official speakers, but has ample data available, and then adapted into our domain, which is a certain dialect, the, the, the Syrian dialect of Arabic, and colloquial language, which is basically how people share messages and so on in social media. How does it perform? First, we do some evaluation through automated methods. One of the most popular in machine translation is the blow scores. Blow scores compare how does your translator perform compared to the reference translations that you have. So we allocated 200 messages for testing and we saw that through domain adaptation, we were able to go from 19.5 blue points to 24.8 blue points. So that's around 5% increase. And comparing basically as a benchmark, because it's one of the most popularly used commercial translation provider, we compared with Google Machine Translation and we saw that they perform only 21.2%. These are correlations, but what do they exactly mean? We want to demonstrate through 
some sentences from our test set. So you see a sentence that says excessive water cuts and high prices, basically a complaint by a refugee, while our engine translates that as high prices, water cuts, Google's non-specialized engine translates that as ex expensive interruption in the water. In another case, we saw that a non-specialized engine confuses a lot terms related with money. So financial conditions being translated as physical conditions, which is totally different. And finally, one of the refugees asked, what does household mean? TWB's adapted engine translates that as, excuse me, what does household work mean? But Google's MT is not able to grasp uh, probably a dialect specific word and just transliterates it, but misses a lot of the meaning. So all these kind of show how important is adapting to your specific case. And you can't just hand it over to a generic engine when, when your use cases concerns a lot of like sensitive material. So our next focal language is Tigrinya. It's a Semitic language spoken by around 7.9 million people, originating from Ethiopia and Eritrea. Right now, a language spoken mainly in the conflicted region of Tigray, and many refugees exist in, in Europe and USA. This is one of the hardest to resource translations in TWB, with around only three active translators in average. 19% of translations being unclaimed in 2020, and with a 72 day of average delay in terms of claiming the translations. We decided to go for a cross-lingual transfer learning approach. What does that mean? This is basically using data from a nearby language in order to improve the models, because knowing that these languages have in common roots, it's proved that mixing data from other languages does help in terms of quality. So for example, in the in the bottom right corner, you see in the red, the score of unilingual baseline system of 22.2% is improved by 1.3% plus scores to 23.6 when we do the cross-lingual transfer. How does that work? That's basically training in three stages, where in the first stage, you do a multilingual model using both data from Americ, Tigrinya, and our own in-domain set. Secondly, adapting to Tigrinya using only data from Tigrinya, and finally adapting to the in-domain set. So this was for Tigrinya to English direction. However, our current challenge and, and actually need is to be to have a model for English to Tigrinya direction, where we are experiencing much more difficulties in terms of getting a moderately, at least, performing model. We see there's an incredible difference in terms of plus scores, which is partially explainable because of the complex morphological structure of Tigrinya compared to English, where plus scores maybe is not the perfect way of evaluating it, but still, there we have observed a lot of quality difference between these. So this is basically where we're collaborating with initiatives called Masakane, uh, which is a grassroots organization who aim to do NLP tools for African languages, including Tigrinya and many others, and also ADAPT, which is a research institution based in Ireland in order to improve our models. So finally, I'm going to speak about our, our efforts for Kongli Swahili, which is one of the languages spoken in Democratic Republic of Congo with around 9 million speakers. Although Swahili is known and is one of the supported languages in, in commercial MT providers, the Kongli's dialect differs a lot in terms of vocabulary, grammar and structure from the coastal dialect, much more influenced from French. So that's why we um, saw the need of developing a specialized engine for that. What we did is we have, of course, used uh, all any data available in the coastal dialect and the transfer learning from that set and also created synthetic parallel data using our models, basically translating the coastal Swahili monolingual data that we found into French and then uh, training our models from there. Having done this, we were able to record a 1.3% blue score increase in the Swahili to 
French direction. And on French to Congolese Swahili direction, we have obtained around 22. So all of these models are accessible through our demos in the Gamayan portal and also the Gamayan, ki uh, Gamayan kits that, that, is, that are constantly being created are accessible from there. So you might be now wondering, okay, how are we planning to use these? We are firstly aware that with the less amount of data there is, as much as you, you try to use techniques, we get many times moderately performing models. So sometimes post-editing, uh, using just by basically integrating this in a CAD tool and then use it as a post-editing tool is not optimal. So what we are currently elaborating is interactive machine translation, a concept developed for neural machine translation by Microsoft India. And instead of basically giving out all the translation at once of a sentence, it is constantly gisting the translator while they're translating. So what they report is faster turnaround. How? Well, instead of typing all the sentences that are in the translation, the translator basically can accept or not the suggestions coming from the machine translation engine and that way basically saving time. And whenever an input is needed, they would start typing only at that point. And compared to both manual translation and post-edit translation, they're reporting uh, improvement. And what is more is that the models are able to perform better with the input from the translators. So you see in this increase of blur score uh, with the amount of input coming from the translator, amount of partial input. So even with a, for example, with a model on Telugu trained on 100,000 sentences, from 12% blue, you can get into 42% blue because you're having input from the translator. This is really promising because this would help a lot the translation of non-experts, basically not they are bilingual, but they are not proficient in translation and so on. So the machine translation, which is trained on past translations, could help these translators to, to basically catch up quicker. And also we see it as a, as a promising tool for crowdsourced data collection because it will make the process much faster. So I'm going to now hand it over to Grace. Thanks, Alp. So one of the things that we're working on right now is data collection in the humanitarian context in which, um, especially with COVID-19 and restrictions in terms of travel and face-to-face -face engagement, many partners have gone to a remote model of collecting information, of doing surveys and interviews with people affected by crisis. Um, normally, you, if you record an audio interview of one hour, it can take anywhere from 12 to 20 hours to transcribe and translate that one hour of audio into usable text for analysis. And so partners such as Impact and Harvard Humanitarian Initiative have approached us for Northeast Nigeria, as well as Kurdish Kermanji to help us, to help do the, the transcription and translation. And we want to apply some of the language technology tools to help speed up and semi-automate this process. So we are working um, with Copal Toolbox, which is the platform where people um, interact to do the surveys, and we want to be able to integrate automatic speech recognition and machine translation into the platform and the user interface. So they're going to take our tools and, and integrate it um, for surveying. And so things that we're looking at doing is um, topic modeling, speaker diarization rhization because sometimes there's focus groups where you'll have three to four speakers and being able to segment that by speaker can help with the transcription process. And we hope to make gains in terms of quality, standardizing terms, um, and also efficiencies in speeding up the process, as I mentioned. So this is ongoing and one of our most frequent use cases so that we want to be able to improve the quality of data collection, have a faster turnaround time so that um, organizations can adapt their programs to the needs of, of people. We've also recently um, launched a conversational AI assistant or chatbot 
in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's different from your basic menu driven system in which you can actually type in your question about COVID in your own language. So um, the chatbot is called Uji and you can speak to it in French, Congolese, Swahili and Lingala. And what we're doing is we are aggregating all the questions that people are asking the chatbot and looking at trends and gaps in information so that we can see what people's needs are for information, what their concerns are. So to give you an example, we've been able to learn that people had specific questions um, for maternal health in COVID. And so we were able to create messages to respond to that need. And um, this month, actually, we're expanding in Nigeria, a, a similar chatbot um, that will speak Hausa, Kanuri, and Shua Arabic. So these are just a few of the uh, use cases that uh, we have going right now that we really want to enable two-way communication and not just providing and disseminating life-saving information, but also hearing the needs and the concerns of people in their own words to better respond to them. Thank you very much. And at this point, we can take questions. I think there are a couple of questions along the way. I was trying to keep up <laughs> typing. <laughs> Yeah, th thanks for for a great presentation. So I, um, uh, I I really love that. I love the diversity of, of languages uh, that that you have there. And um, uh, I lost count on the way through, but um, uh, I think there is at least seven or eight different scripts, um, uh, which is a lot to deal with. On top of, um, like you mentioned, um, limited literacy um, and and. Um, uh, the ultimate goal of, of enabling uh, voice-based translation. Um, so um, is it a reminder for everybody, this is a, a live Q&A session. Uh, we are recording this session. Um, this may be posted on the internet later. That'll be up to the, the speakers after the recording. Uh, if you have any questions for them, uh, please ask in the group chat and then I'll invite you to uh, repeat that question. Um, if you're not comfortable um, uh, being recorded, um, you're welcome to send me a uh, direct question in the chat, um, and then I'll ask that personally. I, I, I won't call on you. Um, uh, and so um, uh, what to kick it off with, um, uh, I was also interested in uh, Pierre's question about uh, topic modeling. I'd love to hear a little bit more about the kind of analysis that you're able to do with, with these kind of unsupervised methods. So to give you an example, um, the World Food Program has or had a hotline in Jordan at the time, and we're collecting about 700 calls per day and people would leave a recorded open ended question. They're trying to understand what people's concerns are, the most pressing ones. And so to be able to process all of that, transcribing, translating 700 messages a day, um, what we wanted to do was automate that and through MT, machine translation first, then being able to look at what the trends are. So for if this week, everyone is talking about high food prices, um, looking at that, or if it was health issues or security, that would really be able to help us automate and better understand large amounts of data and, and look at trends that way. Okay, um, uh, that sounds really interesting. I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to um, <laughs> uh, uh, learn more about that. If you have any papers or any other documents on that, I think a, a lot of people would be, be really interested. Um, We're doing it also uh, so with, sorry, just uh, with our chat bot. Um, we're aggregating all the questions that people are asking about COVID and then being able to, to similarly look at trends, which topics are, are hot, what words are coming up. You know, if, if somebody says lime juice in Nigeria, this, this, there is a rumor going around that lime juice would help prevent mm. COVID. And so you can then find out how, how the frequency of that and, and then be able to turn messages uh, and adapt messaging to uh, help the needs of people for information. Right, that, I, I, that's incredibly important for, for our understanding of, of, of how um, different people are experiencing this pandemic right now. So um, yeah, I look forward to reading more about that. Um, uh, so Ariel, you have a, um, you had a question about um, uh, evaluating the quality of translations. Uh, would you like to, uh, to ask that or would you like me to ask that on your behalf? 
Uh, yeah, I could ask it. It's basically uh, about the feedback that you get from using these apps themselves and how they could be used to kind of, you know, help the uh, machine learning on the on, on the other side. And I don't know if that's the way to do that, but basically uh, knowing that something work or not will be useful. So the way that we did the evaluation of our MT was, as Alp outlined, a comparison. So taking the output from Google, comparing it to our machine translation, and then asking our translators to rate it in terms of frequency, like we had different parameters on uh, fluency, frequent um, adequacy, and um, just general preference, I think was one of them as well. And then from there, we were able to ascertain um, the usefulness and we want to further go into looking at gains in time. Um, we haven't done that so far, but that's something that we would like to look at. All right, and um, uh, uh, Suyash, so you had a, a question uh, about speech. Uh, would you would you like to ask that? Sure. Uh, yeah, great, great talk. Um, I was wondering, if, I know you didn't go deep into it, but if you could get, shed some light into what is the state of uh, speech? There is a lot of work around speech synthesizers, especially in the context of uh, these regional uh, languages. And how, how can that be improved if you know, it's not high quality right now? Um, I, can, I can get this. Um, for, except for one project, for many of these languages, such technology is non-existent. There's been a... Um, there's a project called CMU Wilderness. No, there's a corpus called CMU, CMU Wild, Wilderness Corpus, which collected speech data from Bible audio, and they were able to make some kind of a TTS for many languages. That includes many of what we work in. Um, but yeah, like usability of that is like doubt it's like um, I wouldn't really trust that in a crisis situation um, actually we did uh, evaluate that the usability of that but in, in a crisis nobody really wants to hear a robotic voice giving you um, um, orders or whatever um, yes for for Kurmanji we have like there's not much clean data exists for these languages if if um, only only a handful of them. Unfortunately, even the ones that are spoken by millions, it's really hard to find. Um, but yeah, TTS is definitely actually one of the um, low hanging fruit because it needs a corpus of a single speaker, which which we can obtain, for example, through our linguists. The harder task. And actually, the more useful task is automatic speech recognition, where we need speech data from lots of people. From yes, and yeah, recently we have we are trying to, for example, get Kurmanji. If you know the project Common Voice from Mozilla, like on top of us actually making recordings and so on, um, to to get. An ample amount of data you need to really get to the communities and get people um, recording um, audio data on their own. So, for example, we're trying to get Kurmanji into the Common Voice project and hoping to get, for example, data from there. Um, let's see what other am I skipping, Grace? As for Swahili, um, we have been collect. Yeah, we have collected for the coastal Swahili again a speech corpus, but from a single speaker. So it's it's much less accessible than machine translation, I would say. What I can add is we're looking at different types of use cases. Um, so for Congolese Swahili, there is a hotline where you can call in and get information on many topics, including COVID and whatnot. And it's an IVR system. So you press two and, and they were finding that people with low digital literacy, there's a lot of dropouts. Um, so rather than listening, then trying to figure out, okay, what button do I have to pick? If the people would be able to access the menu just by one word. So you, you say health 
And then you can get the menu with all the health information or even starting with saying your language, Swahili, in Swahili, a limited vocabulary um, ASR is a good place to start. So uh, having, you know, a hundred words or terms um, that would be much easier to attain than a general speech recognizer. Right, and uh, I think interesting follow-up question. Um, it's obviously hard enough to work in a low resource language, but what if you've got many mixed in? So um, Abhishek, uh, uh, are you there to, to ask your question? Hi, <laughs> good to see you, Robert. And uh, yes, Grace and Nath, thank you for the presentation. I will be joining your team on Monday. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, so <laughs> get in your you're getting your research in in advance of your start there then. <laughs> yeah, lucky me. Thanks for telling me about this talk. So of course you talked about all these different languages in isolation, but is is there a need to look into the problem of code mixing? Does it show up a lot in the context in which we work? And if there if it does, then how do you deal with multiple languages in the same sentence or same statement? So the use case would be the chatbot, for example, in which it's available in three languages. And so if you engage with it in French, it'll respond to you in French. If you engage in Lingala, it'll reply to you in Lingala. Um, I think Alp would be better placed than I would be to explain how we manage that, but the magic behind the scenes. <laughs> right now at hoc, I would say like that is a that is a huge task. We're trying to, yeah, we're trying to grasp in the chatbots scene. Um, to be honest, right now we're just like down to the classifier. And yes, if it sees a, a prominent word in one in a in another language, although the sentence fully is in another one, um, the classifier can get confused easily. For for machine translation, this is not. Um, yeah, it's not. It's never really occurred as a problem. For ASR, I would say, or like speech, um, I predict that it would be better, um, no, much more important. But there I would say the solution would be adding those vocabularies. Like, I don't think it's enough to have one, vocab one vocabulary from only from that language, but mix in whatever words you might have um in nearby languages into the asr vocabulary that you work with sure uh, thanks yeah but good question i know in india this is like a hot topic um in indian languages and yeah all Wait, right so you I, see I, that? I, I, sorry that's we can chat later without you know everybody else go ahead all right. Well, and, and good luck when you when you start on on, on Monday um, in the in the in the new job. They're they're lucky to have you. It's great to see smart people. Working Thank together. you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, Chris, you, you had a question related to doing new languages. Well, I don't know if Chris is there. The, the question was, um, uh, can everyone use this app, and and does it support Indian languages? We haven't been um, working on Indian languages. Uh, the the way that it works is, um, you know, we have partner organizations uh, responding to crisis or development work as well. So based upon what their needs are, we're working in over 200 language pairs and there hasn't been a huge demand for Indian languages. I think there's a pretty established uh, translation industry in India, um, but there hasn't been a pressing need for us. And so we haven't been developing any tools thus far. All right, um, uh, Priyanka, you had a, a, a question about the technical side of things. Yeah, so I was just wondering um, about the analysis you had mentioned you did um, to understand the most common questions and be able to automate the responses with the chatbot. Uh, I was just wondering kind of what process did you guys take to kind of identify those? most common questions? Uh, so the content um, was specifically for the chatbot and it was based upon you know, guidance from the Ministry of Health in DRC, uh, as well as um, research that we were doing in the field and partners were doing in the field on, on 
what their perceptions were about COVID and obviously WHO guidance. So it wasn't that we were looking for new material, but we knew what common questions there were and then adapted it and contextualized it um, for, for the chatbot. And now we have about 200 different intents or, you know, question areas that people can ask about. We added Ebola as, as well on top of COVID. Oh, okay, got it. So, so the questions were developed based on, um, based on your research rather than the questions asked themselves. Well, now, uh, now that we, we had to start from somewhere. So that's what we did for the first initial. But as we started collecting questions from the community, then we're adapting the content. So for example, there are some questions about you know, maternal health linked to COVID. So then we approached the Ministry of Health to get some guidance so that we can answer the question about that and, and give people some information. Okay, got it. So, so we really want to tailor the information uh, based upon people's needs. And in terms of like the algorithms, uh, we are using Raza and they're like, yeah, it's, it's built on a, on their own specific, they have an own specific algorithm based on, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can choose your pipeline through word vectors and 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 classifiers and so on so it's we're going with the default architecture there is actually that makes sense so you, and i i think we should invite Raza to be speakers at, at bay area nlp um, we haven't done as much on speech as, as i would like and they were very successful um a very successful library um, it's good to hear that you're you're relying on on existing technology there as well. I think you're um, <laughs> you're taking on a big enough challenge at the moment that you would want to try and build your own chatbot um, infrastructure yeah, yeah. as well. Not um, the wheel here. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so related to uh, uh, to product decisions, Nina, it sounds like you have a a question or, or maybe a suggestion related to uh, translation if you're there. Yes, um, my question was that I actually work as a professional interpreter and translator, and um, sometimes the the translation is can be very very nuanced, and the meaning could be completely can kind of pivot around just one word, and so like a negative phrase can be interpreted as a positive, and vice versa. So um, and and often with machine translation, uh, you know that that kind of new nuance sometimes gets lost. And so um, one thought I had is whether it's something that you've considered to translate the length, the, um, let's say you go to Swahili, translate it back from Swahili to the original language for the person trying to communicate to ensure that their phrase or their meaning got uh, conveyed properly. Or we, we experimented a little bit with uh, sentiment analysis and exactly as you said, Nina, that you get the polar opposite of what it should be because of these subtleties. Um, in terms of whenever we do use MT, we always post edit. So there's a review process. We haven't looked into doing back translation per se, but um, I don't know, Alp, if you want to elaborate. Um, I, I couldn't actually like grasp the question. Um... Uh, just that sometimes the translation is accurate, and if you've uh, considered, uh, I think uh, Grace mentioned one format, uh, but if you considered other approaches to ensuring accuracy. Um, well, human input. Yeah, that's Definitely. the best, right? <laughs> like, there's, there's no way you can... Uh, like hand the, hand the task over to machine translation, especially when you're translating like uh, sensitive documents, um, yeah, vital information and so on. Um, we titled the talk basically actually coming from that aim, coming from that objective, not to take the translation out of the translator's hands, but to make, um, make their work easier and, and, and increase the potential through using machinery, basically. Um, we, like all these, um, all these approaches are, um, are thought with a human in the loop. Um, so nuances will be missed 
there will be wrong translations there will be negatives missed like um the aim is never like to make the perfect translation because we're aware we there's there's a long way to get there especially when the in the lack of in the under resourced settings so yeah the, the quick answer is getting a human looking at them and fixing thank you all right and um uh, eric you have a, a question uh related to uh where the, the app can be deployed oh yeah it's just simple kind of question i guess that if the idea is uh to deploy these translations in very under-resourced places um you know it's uh can these be run just on a mobile device on a phone or do you always need to be connected to the internet uh to use these tools so Kobol Toolbox, for example, is a tool that uh, can be used offline and we're developing tools with them. So MT, for example, in which then, yes, the API goes to, to Kobo and then everything can be used offline. Um, we developed a glossary as well, um, several glossaries actually for different contexts. So one specifically on COVID and one for the Bangladesh Rohingya refugee crisis in which yes, all of our tools can be accessible offline because we know that connectivity is an issue. All right. Thank you. And Thanks for the question, Eric. Um, so I, I remember, I think we, we answered your question um, about uh, where, where the uh, the data came from um, and, and um, uh, for that part, uh, please let me know if, if not. Uh, Craig, uh, thanks for sharing that, that information about uh, Rohingya script. Um, I believe Rohingya uses many scripts. That's what Hanifi is the, the traditional script, um, but um, Latin script and, and Arabic script are, are also used for it. Um, as interesting aside, um, uh, because um, Hanifi's script is non-standard, um, there is a non-Unicode supported version of it, which is supported um, uh, uh, by uh, cell phone networks in the region. Um, unfortunately, this was one of the reasons that um, when the, uh, the genocide was being perpetrated there, that it wasn't picked up on social media. Um, uh, a lot of the information, especially on Facebook, was being shared in a non-standard script. Um, and so because it wasn't Unicode compliant, it actually slipped through um, some of the filters for, um, uh, for hate speech and, and for banned uh, behavior. Um, uh, so this is, um, you know, obviously something that um, is just really fundamental to, to support in a lot of languages is just to, you know, make sure that there are standardized encodings. Um, uh, so it's good to see that that, um, that standardized encoding does exist and hopefully it'll get more, um, uh, more wide support. Um, all right, uh, uh, next question. Uh, Pierre, you had a, a question about uh, phonetic transcriptions. Yes, thank you for this uh, great work. I was wondering whether you did uh, consider experimenting with a direct phonemic transcription rather than uh, orthographic transcription, because it could allow you to leverage from larger data set mixing different languages. And I believe that you can still use some of the algorithm you are using through so transtopic modeling after that without relying on first machine translation and then doing uh, applying topic modeling on uh, clean uh, transcribed and translated script. So did you did you explain? Because I know it's a hot topic in the for some work in the field linguistics where they need to transcribe uh, low resource languages. But I don't know if you did try it out or not, or if you have any comment to do on this kind of uh, trend. We have come, come, come across this. And yes, I mean, experimentation, yes, we did. Um, actually, the, yeah, the tool we worked with, Allosaurus, was, it was called, maybe you know, um, is developed in the research group of Graham Newbig, which is also one of um, Gamayan's advisors, our project's advisors. It's, I think that um, it's, it's a good, so it could be useful for topic modeling and so on, but like to get actual transcriptions and, and so on, it's not really great. It doesn't really work great. It's, it has a long way to 
to get a script out of it because we in most of the cases we are interested in the script itself but yes like having an idea what um what they say in a in a hotline in a call hotline um that could be a, that could be something to experiment with All right, um, Mike, you have a question about infrastructure. Yeah, uh, thanks for your time, guys. Just quick question. Uh, what platform or infrastructure do you guys use to support your empty services? I know there's like a lot of services, so there could be different platforms you use. And curious as to how these are funded. Um, is it coming from Translators Without Borders, uh, donators, or are these contributors? I see Google, Facebook, AWS, and Microsoft as contributors. Um, for the funding, I can take that. Um, we, the contributors to the Tico were the big, you know, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and, and Amazon. But for our, our program, Gamma Yoon, we have a mixture of rep, uh, income from Cisco, from Microsoft, from different grants. We're working with the Humanitarian Grand Challenge, which is part of, well, what used to be DFID, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Dutch and USAID. So um, primarily it is grant uh, related for the funding for the project currently. In terms of infrastructure, I'll leave that to Al. Yeah, um, I can get that. So we are, we are currently developing our, our, I mean, for developing the models and so on, we use OpenNMT. And for the demos that you would see on the page are like really simple calls um, that are using purely an OpenNMT. Uh, we are currently developing our API um, to serve in the languages we are interested in to, I don't know, to serve to, for example, projects like Kobo and also to serve in our translation interfaces like cat tools and so on. So we right now it's living in our in our GP servers, and and since there's not a huge amount of traffic, they're basically now being developed. Um, it hasn't been a question of the funding and 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 yeah, I mean. Of the of, of living it in a in a server and, and handling a lot of traffic. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have a, a couple of interesting comments. Uh, Suyash, yeah, made a great comment that um, this kind of autocomplete uh, approach to translation uh, predates that Microsoft paper. Uh, in fact, it was first developed. Uh, Pre-neural MT days um, here in the Bay Area. Um, uh, it came out of research at Stanford. Um, and is now used in a, a number of different platforms. Uh, Abhishek, thanks for the shameless plug for my book. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, and thank you, Craig, for um, offering to share that resource. Uh, I actually didn't even know that this existed. Um, uh, so um, I'm sure that that could be useful, if it, especially that's public somewhere. Uh, and so we, uh, we have time for a few more questions and we've just exhausted the ones which are currently in the chat. Um, so if you have a burning question that you'd like to ask in, uh, in the last couple of minutes, uh, now is your chance. I think that uh, there might have been one earlier, which um, which got missed, which was uh, what's next on the roadmap for for languages. I'm not sure if you covered that or not. Yes, um, we have. Uh, I've lost count now. Um, nearly ten languages that we're working on, and as I mentioned earlier, it, it is quite dynamic. We're interested in. Um, Yes, because of what's happening in, in Tigray, um, further developing our Tigrinya and then perhaps looking at Amharic, I'm not quite sure. There's There's been talk about Somali and and obviously there's more languages than, than what we can actually do and what we have funding for. So um, sometimes it's a combination of being opportunistic on, on having that right use case because the technology alone isn't enough. We need to be able to um, really show the utility of it and integrated into the workflow um, for our partners to make it actually useful. So um, yeah, Lingala, um, Nande, the, the languages in Northeast Nigeria that we're focusing on for the next um, chatbot is uh, Kanuri and Hausa. What else did I miss? Um, oh, mm -hmm. I think. That's on our immediate focus for the next year. We were talking about 
Ameri some American languages, but I guess we were only focusing on Spanish, right? Uh, for Spanish. that project, yeah. But there is definite interest in indigenous languages uh, for the Venezuelan migrant crisis and, and what's happening in, in, in Guatemala, for example. Um, so there's things that we'd like to do, but yeah, focusing right now on these. All right, I think we've got time for, for one last question. Uh, John, if you're there to, to ask that. Um, and Jeff and Craig, sorry, acknowledging that we're not gonna have time for, for your questions. Uh, yeah, I was just curious with the chatbots because um, you know you use the languages, but tech, you know, with language, there's always a cultural component to it. I don't know if there's like any types of cultural testing done with the expectations with the chatbots and Absolutely. how they interact. Yes, not only with the chatbots for, but for a lot of the crisis response that we do, we have we recruit linguists, we train linguists, and then we also test terminology, especially new things like social distancing didn't exist last year. Um, so what we do is work with the community, specifically for the chatbot and DRC. We're working with the Red Cross community, so they have thousands of volunteers in Congo, and we are testing um, the bot with them. So have the ability to test, um, yeah. The terminology and the chatbot itself with them. Well, thanks. You're welcome. All right, so we're we're here on the hour. Um, so uh, apologies if we we missed uh, your your couple of uh, uh, questions at the end. Um, uh, especially Craig, yours about uh, Fulani. I'm always interested in West African languages, having lived there before I moved to to the U.S. Actually, I, I believe Jana, who was just on the call, did field work there um, uh, as well. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, uh, yeah, uh, Alpa and, and, and Grace, uh, thank you again for, for what was uh, an amazing presentation. Um, uh, it's such important work um, uh, to be able to bring information people, to people in their language. Um, you know, speakers of, of low resource languages are, are disproportionately more likely uh, to be the victims of um, man-made and, and natural disasters. Um, uh, so this is a, a really important application of uh, the kind of technology that, that we're all building. Um, so we, we wish you the, um, uh, the best of luck in your work and thank you again. Thank you very much for having us. It's been a pleasure and happy holidays, everybody. Yeah.